Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears to his disciples, and their reaction is what you might expect. They're scared, they're startled, they think that maybe they're seeing a ghost, they're troubled. And then Jesus reassures them. He shows them that he's flesh and blood, he's not a spirit. He points to his hands and his feet with the crucifixion scars. And then he does something interesting. He asks them if they have anything to eat. And they give him a, a fish, and he eats the fish in front of them. Now, what I want to do in this video, one of the things, is I want to go back to the Old Testament and to look at the background of oceans and seas and fish and then trace that trajectory into the ministry of Jesus and then conclude with some possibilities of the symbolism behind Jesus eating this fish. After that, Jesus says that everything written about him and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms has been fulfilled. Now, why did Jesus add this third category, the Psalms? Typically, the Old Testament was divided into just the law and the prophets. Well, we're going to look at some, some literature that's contemporary or a little bit before the first century to show how there was the beginning of a third division within the Old Testament, a little bit of that canon background. And then I want to answer the question, where does the Old Testament talk about the message of the Messiah going out to all the nations? Because Jesus says that everything that, is, that has happened to him, this message of the kingdom, needs to be taken from Jerusalem, beginning at Jerusalem, and then to all the nations. Well, we'll see that in the book of Acts, then we have a, we have a quotation in the book of Acts that is echoing Isaiah chapter 49. That's going to give us the Old Testament background for that. So that's where we're going with this. Let's begin with Luke chapter 24, verses 36 and following. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Now, the first thing to note is just this grouping together of all these responses, reactions on the part of the disciples. They were startled. They were frightened. They thought they saw a ghost. They were troubled. We'll come back to that one in a minute. They were doubting. They disbelieved for joy, like it was too good to be true. And they, they were marveling. So all these reactions. Now, that one toward the bottom in Greek is terasso, to be troubled. And the reason I find that one particularly interesting is because if you go back to the big, so we're in the end of Luke's gospel. If you go back to the beginning of Luke's gospel, who is troubled? Zechariah is troubled. Same Greek verb that is used there. So this troubled reaction on the part of those to whom a divine message is given, that book ends the gospel of Luke. It begins with Zechariah being troubled about this angelic announcement of John the Baptist's birth, and then it ends with his disciples troubled because of this surprise appearance of their resurrected Lord. Well, one of the things, one of the reactions that the disciples have is that they, they think they see a spirit, or they think they see a ghost. So let's just take one moment to remember one of the early church heresies. Okay, it's called docetism. And the reason I want to talk about it is because docetism is named on the basis of the Greek verb dokeo, which means to appear or to seem or to think. So the disciples dokeo, they thought they saw a ghost. Now, docetism basically teaches that instead of Christ actually having flesh and blood, that he only appeared or seemed to have that. So it was almost kind of like he had ghost flesh, as it were, that he seemed to have a human nature, but he really did not. Now, this denies the incarnation. It denies the resurrection. It denies that our Lord has assumed our humanity. And so, of course, not being in conformity with the scriptures, it was condemned as a heresy at the First Council of Nicaea in 325. But it's a good occasion for us to remember that the flesh and blood with which our Lord was born and crucified is also the same flesh and blood in which he was resurrected. So he has assumed our humanity and that humanity he has resurrected and he shows to his disciples on the day of his resurrection. Now, let's talk about this fishing, this Gentile fishing. Let's get the Hebrew background to begin with. 
So if you look over the Old Testament, you're going to find a number of cases where the oceans, the seas, the great sea creatures, fish, all of these storms are associated with the Gentile world. Just, this is just a sampling on the screen here, just a, a small sampling of many verses. Psalm 144 talks about how deliverance from the waters is actually deliverance from foreigners, from Gentile nations. Isaiah 17 says the thundering of the Gentiles is like the thundering and the roaring of the seas. Daniel 7, in that great Son of Man vision. And Isaiah 51 says that Gentile kingdoms and their rulers are like the ocean creatures, like that legendary or mythological creature Rahab. And interestingly, we find this same thing carried over into the New Testament in the book of Revelation, where in Revelation 17, John says that the waters are the peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Kind of interesting note here about Jonah. Perhaps you've never thought about the story of Jonah in this way, but Jonah is fleeing from the face of God, right? He's fleeing from the presence of God, and so where does he go? He goes to where the Gentiles are, and he's on a ship with Gentile sailors, and they're sailing on this Gentile sea, this sea emblematic of the Gentile world, and what happens? Well, He's swallowed by this great sea creature, which elsewhere is iconic of Gentile rulers, all of which has led some people, including myself, to think that what we have here is kind of a a story that also fits with the life of Israel. In other words, a story of one man, Jonah, that also is fitting with the story of Israel. Because Jonah is going to be swallowed by this great sea creature, emblematic also of Gentile rulers, and then he's going to be expelled later, released later, and the same thing is going to happen to Israel. They're going to undergo their watery exile. That is to say, they're going to be swallowed by the great sea creature, the great Gentile creature of Babylon, and then later released to return to their homeland. So perhaps a couple of different things are going on there in the story of Jonah. All that Old Testament background, now let's bring it into the New Testament. Of course, you're familiar with Jesus calling his disciples at the Sea of Galilee. But have you ever thought to think, have you ever stopped to think about the fact that his calling of them there is significant? Because if you look at Matthew 5, which of course is quoting Isaiah, it's called Galilee of the Gentiles. They're on the edge of this Gentile world here. So Galilee is associated with the Gentile world. He calls fishermen, and then he says these fishermen are going to be catching men, Luke 5, 11. Well, they'll be fishers of men, Matthew 4, 19. In other words, he's gathering together these, these 12 guys, and they're going to be like the new 12 patriarchs of Israel. And except for, they won't, they won't be uh, conquering nations, they're going to be catching Gentiles, they'll be catching men in the seas of the world. Why? So they can build up and expand Israel. Okay, now you get all that together, and let's go back to Luke chapter 24. Jesus is eating a fish. He's eating a fish in the presence of his disciples. So he asks them, do you have anything? They give him the piece of fish. Jesus consumes it, and as he does it, in my opinion, we have him visually enacting the incorporation of the Gentiles into the kingdom. Just like that fish entered into the literal body of Christ, so fish, that is the Gentiles, the part of the 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 oceanic Gentile world full of Gentiles are now going to be entering into the body of Christ. And after he eats it and says that all the Old Testament has been fulfilled, he says that forgiveness should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. So note the progression here. We go from his resurrection to where he eats fish to where he talks about the Old Testament being fulfilled and now to the Gentiles hearing the message of the kingdom. Now, If you're you're interested in reading a little bit more about this, you can check out this article that I've written at 1517.org, Why Did God Add Fish to His Diet? I think it's it's an explanation and interpretation at least worthy of contemplation given this very rich and, and full background in the Old Testament and then into the ministry of Jesus of fish and their symbolism connected with the Gentile world. Okay, let's move on to the second part of the gospel. This is from Luke 24, where Jesus says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer 
and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of the, my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, if you open up your English Bible, I'm assuming most of you who are watching this video are users of English Bibles, perhaps some other translation, but a translation. If you open it up and you look at the, basically the, the division of the Old Testament, what you're going to find is usually something like this. You've got a five-fold division, the Pentateuch, the history books, poetry or wisdom, the major prophets, and the minor prophets. That's a typical way in which English and other, and other modern languages have the Old Testament arranged. That doesn't reflect, however, the Hebrew arrangement. So the Hebrew is typically arranged into a tripartite or threefold division. The Torah, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The prophets, which in Hebrew is the Nevi'im. Now these prophets aren't just like Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel and Hosea and the other prophets. This is also what are called the prophetic historical books, books like Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. These are understood not just to be histories, but prophetic histories. So what we consider to be historical books would have been, would have been grouped under the Nevi'im, the prophetic writings. And then the third category is the writings, which in Hebrew is the Katuvim. This would be Psalms, Proverbs, Job, books of that nature. Now together, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Katuvim, that T-N-K, is where we get the acronym Tanakh, which is a Jewish name for what Christians usually call the Old Testament. Now, why did I bring this up? Because what we see in the first century at the time of Jesus is primarily a twofold division. So they really don't talk so much about the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, but we are beginning to see evidence, and one of these evidences is in Luke chapter 24, of the, the second section, the prophets, being some books within that being split off into this third category that later came to be called the writings. So Luke chapter four is 24 is one evidence of this, where Jesus refers to the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. But we also have something from the Greek prologue to Sirach, or also known as Ecclesiasticus. It's part of the Apocrypha. And what happened was the, the author of, of Sirach the author of Ecclesiasticus, his grandson translated that from Hebrew into Greek, and he added a prologue. And in this prologue, the grandson says that his grandfather studied the law, the prophets, and other books of our, forefa of our forefathers of our, or of our fathers. So he also seems to be sort of grouping these into a third category. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have evidence in 4Q397 of a possible threefold division, where there's the book of Moses and the words of the prophets, and then of David mentioned. So David being connected with the book of Psalms, perhaps this also is kind of behind what Jesus is saying when he refers to this threefold grouping in Luke chapter 24. And then a contemporary of Jesus, Philo, who was a Jewish philosopher in Egypt, when he's writing about the Therapeuti, which was a, a Jewish group in his The Contemplative Life, he says that the Therapeuti would take the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, and they would study these. So all of this to say that when, when Jesus refers to the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, he too might be reflecting this pretty common emerging threefold division of the Old Testament. Another possibility that is that Jesus isolated the Psalms because the Psalms talk so much about him. Uh, he quotes the Psalms, of course, multiple times in his own ministry as referring to him, as do many of the other apostles and teachers in, in, in the New Testament. So could be both of these are true at, at the same time. Okay, Jesus says, everything written about me has been fulfilled. I am the fullness and the fulfillment of the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. Now, this is fascinating. The Greek verb for open is dianoigo, and it's used three times in Luke, Luke 24. Once, or twice rather, with the Emmaus disciples. When Jesus breaks bread with them, we're told in Luke 24, 31, their eyes were dianoigo. They were open, and they recognized Jesus, and then he vanishes. In Luke 24, 32, they're right after this. These two disciples are saying to each other, 
didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he dianoigo, while he opened to us the scriptures? So he was opening the scriptures and their eyes are open. Now Luke chapter 24, verse 45, our text we're looking at. Then Jesus opened their minds, dianoigo, their minds to understand the scriptures. Now that in and of itself is amazing, but it's even more when you, even more amazing when you look at the Old Testament background. Because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 and 7, we have, in the, in the course of the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we have this same verb occurring. The serpent says to Adam and Eve, or to Eve, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be denoigo, opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And of course, they consume the forbidden fruit, and then what happens? Verse 7, the eyes of both were denoigo, they were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And then one more verse, 2 Kings 6, 17, this is when Elisha prays that God would open the eyes of his servant, and the eyes are open, and he sees this heavenly reality that's all around him that he was unable to see before until God acted to open his eyes. Now, what's the significance of all this? Well, especially when you put Luke 24 and Genesis chapter 3 together, you see how they are connected, right? When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and rebelled against the word of God, their eyes were open. They saw their shame. They saw their nakedness. But now, when Jesus breaks bread with these two Emmaus disciples, again, two and two, what happens? Their eyes are open. They see Jesus. Their minds, their hearts are open as a result of this. So what do they see? They see the very one promise back in Genesis 3.15. They see the seed who's come to crush the head of the serpent and come to bring about salvation. And all this is a great reminder to us that as much as we can study the Scriptures, and we should, and as much as we should educate ourselves, and we should, in the end, it's a gift of God. It's a gift of His Spirit that our eyes are open, our minds are open, our hearts are open to understand that Christ is the one that the entire Scripture is about. The Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the, the Ketuvim, the, the entirety of the Old Testament is about Him. He is the fulfillment and He is the fullness of these Scriptures. Okay, Jesus goes on to say, that all of these things were necessary to happen. It was, it was divinely necessary that these, in particular, these three things happen. And he has, in the Greek, it's three infinitives. The first one is, it was necessary for him to suffer. Secondly, it was necessary for him to rise. And then thirdly, it was necessary that this message be preached, beginning at Jerusalem and going to the ends of the earth. Now, I want to focus on that third. So, beginning at Jerusalem and then to all the nations— now, if you look in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we have a parallel to what's said in Luke 24. In Acts 1, 8, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Of course, he's talking about Pentecost. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to heos eskatu teskes, to the end of the earth. So like concentric circles going out, like ripples on a pond, Right. The center is Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Now, if you compare what is said in Acts 1.8 with what God says of his messianic servant in Isaiah 49.6, you'll see the parallel. God says of his servant, it is too light a thing. So it's, just, it's, it, it's not enough that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. In other words, it's not enough for my servant simply to be sent to the people of Israel. No, he's going to do more. God says, I will make you as a light for the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach heos as katu teskes, unto the ends of the earth. So you see that what Jesus is saying is that, listen, the entirety of the scriptures have been fulfilled in me in my death, in my rising, and now this message is going to be spread by you, who are my witnesses, to the ends of the earth. And this is a fulfillment of Genesis 3, of course, but it's also primarily a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 12, where God says to Abraham that you're going to be a blessing to not just his descendants, but to all the nations. So the promise that God reiterated throughout the Old Testament is now coming to fulfillment. Now that everything has been done, now that all God's promises are yes in Jesus Christ, now that Christ has cried out from the cross to tell us, Ty, it is finished, this message is going to spread from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost ends of the earth. And thanks be to God that's a reality because most of us who are watching this 
we are part of that ends of the earth. And that message has come to us, a message of God's fulfillment of his promises in Christ on our behalf. Now, if you are a regular watcher of my videos, which I usually put out on Monday of every week, I want you to know that next Monday, I probably next week, I probably will not be producing a video. Uh, I'm going to be at a 1517 event in Northwest Arkansas, and I'm going to stay a few extra days. And so my time next week will be very limited, but I will pick it up with the following week. So I will see you back in about two weeks, two weeks from now. I pray that you're all doing well, and I pray that God's mercy and grace in Jesus Christ may be yours in abundance. We will see you soon. Thanks.